Hello and welcome. Okay, this video is about the sieve of Eratosthenes, which is an interesting algorithm for finding prime numbers. But precisely, it's about the two variants of that algorithm called the segmented and the incremental sieve of Eratosthenes. Now, I imagine most people watching this are familiar with my homemade CPU video series. And one of the first significant demos I made for that processor was a implementation of the sieve of Eratosthenes as a, as a way of demonstrating that the CPU was functionally complete with a fully operational arithmetic and logic unit. And so I will be talking a little bit about why I picked that algorithm and what made it interesting as a test implementation. So this algorithm was named after Eratosthenes of Cyrene, who was the chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria. But he's actually better known for first calculating the circumference of the Earth by means of measuring shadow lengths during the summer solstice. Okay, since this algorithm is for calculating prime numbers, let's first have a quick reminder of what they are. Now, the schoolyard description is a number that divides only by one in itself. If you look in a dictionary, you'll get something more like this a natural number greater than one that is not a product of two smaller natural numbers. And this description is a little bit more precise, and it also gives us a few clues about how we can construct an algorithm for finding them. Now we're going to start with looking at the standard form of the sieve of Eratosthenes, but in both the standard and the segmented, we're looking for the prime numbers up to an upper bound. And in the standard form, we start by writing down a list of those numbers. In this case, I'm going to go up to 100. Now, I'm purposefully starting at zero here because it's going to help in the description of the later variants. The algorithm itself is very simple. What we're going to do is progress through the numbers from the start of the table and to the top. And whenever we come across a number that we can't discount as being prime, we know it's prime. Now, as part of our definition of prime numbers, we know we can discard zero and one. And each time we disregard a number, we cross it out. So the first number we come across that isn't crossed out is number two. And so we add that to our list of prime numbers. The next step of the algorithm is to cross out every single multiple of that number because we know that the multiples of a prime can't be prime themselves. And in the case of two, this is all of the even numbers. Now we go back to the first step of the algorithm, we move on to the number three, and it too hasn't been crossed out. So we know that three is prime. And then we move on and we cross out all the multiples of three. So then we come on to four, which we've already crossed out. So we know that's not prime. And then we move to five. That's not been crossed out. So we know five is a prime number. So once again, we add it to our list and then we cross out all the multiples of it. Now, as we progress through this list, the crossing out gets easier and easier because there are fewer multiples of larger numbers within the range. Six is not prime. Seven, once again, is prime. And we cross out the multiples of that. OK, we're starting to speed up a little bit more. Eight and nine and ten are all crossed out. So 11 is our next prime. Twelve isn't. Then 13 is prime. So these are actually what are referred to as twin primes. So the primes are starting to become a lot less frequent now, but 17 is the next one we can see. Then 19, then we get to 23, 29, 31, 37. Now at this point, we're only crossing out one number with each new prime, 41, 43, and 47. Now the next prime is 53, but we're more than halfway through our table. So we're not actually going to cross out any numbers now because any multiple of primes at this point will be outside our range. So actually, everything we haven't crossed out at this point, we know is going to be prime. So this is the complete form of the basic sieve of Eratosthenes, and we have successfully found all the prime numbers up to 100. Well, I hope I explained that well, but I actually think it's a very simple and elegant algorithm. And I think it's a good one to use for a bit of programming practice as well, particularly when you're getting used to a new language. But I do think it's worth talking about the limitations of the algorithm because those are going to give us clues as to how we can extend the algorithm to be a bit more useful. 
Now, first and foremost, this algorithm takes a lot of memory. If we wanted to test for prime numbers up to a million, we would need a million entries in our table. Whilst most simple code examples we use bytes or integers for each entry, we could just use a single bit flag and therefore fit eight of them in a byte, which will bring the memory requirement down. But still, as we go up in size for the numerical range, we would still start needing a lot of memory. That also brings us on to the second big limitation of this algorithm, and that's that the early primes need a lot of crossing out. When I implemented the Civer Eratosthenes for my CPU, I was very much interested in getting primes up to 65,536, which is the 16-bit range. But if I had used a byte per entry, I would have required 64 kilobytes, or if I was using bits, it would have been eight kilobytes of RAM, which would actually fit reasonably well. But for that first prime, number two, I would need to cross out half of that range, which would be 32,768 iterations of a loop. And that would be kind of nasty because I'd have quite a big delay between starting the alg algorithm and actually moving from the number two to the number three, which wouldn't be very interesting. So for both of those reasons, it was actually advantageous to move on. And what I actually implemented is formally known as the segmented sieve of Eratosthenes because it gives us a number of advantages. So a good question to ask at this point is which primes do we actually need to check to ascertain that a number is not composite? You'll notice in the grid before that many numbers were struck out more than one time, but we only need one factor to know that the number is composite. And of course, we're going to strike that out with the lowest prime factor. So we need to think about what that lowest prime factor might be. So if a number isn't prime, the smallest that the lowest prime factor could be is the square root of that number. Because if we were multiplying it by anything smaller than itself, we would have come across that other number first. Let's look back at the primes table and see if that makes sense. Okay, so the square root of 100 is 10. And actually, if we look at this, we did note down which numbers were involved in crossing out each of the composite numbers. And you can in fact see that these first four primes, everything under 10, have accounted for the first cross out of each of the numbers in this entire table. So let's go back to the beginning and see if we can use this information to turn the sieve of Eratosthenes into the segmented sieve. So rather than needing a table for the entire range of numbers we're calculating, now the segment size doesn't have to be, but it's easiest to think about it as being the size of that square root. So in this case, our first segment is going to be the first 10 entries. Now the first thing we need is the list of primes below the square root. So we want to find the primes under 10. To do that, we're going to use the standard form of the sieve of Eratosthenes. So just as before, we can cross out 0 and 1. We find 2 as the first prime number, cross out the multiples. But we're only needing a table size of that square root size. So in a much smaller period of time, we've identified the four prime numbers that fall into our range. Now, crucially, when we were crossing out numbers, we only had to go up to 10. And the moment we crossed outside of the current segment, we didn't need to count anymore. So already we can see we get those first four prime numbers a lot quicker than if we were implementing the standard sieve. And now we move on to the next segment. The crucial addition here is that for each of our relevant prime numbers, we record the last number we crossed out. And when we move on to the next segment, we continue where we left off. First, we look at the multiples of two and cross those out, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And we look at the multiples of three, 12, 15, and 18, but only 15 is a new cross out. The multiples of five are 10 and 15. We've already crossed both of those out. And the multiples of seven are 14. And we've already crossed that out. So with that stage complete, everything left over in the segment we now know to be prime. And we can move on to the next segment. First, we've got the multiples of two, three, five, and seven. In this segment, we've just got the two primes. And you can see we've got these two distinct stages. First, where we complete the original sieve, and then the segmented section is actually just as simple, but we're doing a different algorithm. But while the algorithm is slightly more complex with the two distinct phases, 
it does produce a much simpler set of operations for each new prime output, which is why I really liked this one as a demonstration on my homebrew CPU. Now, always masking out the multiples of two is the most time consuming part, but we'd still have much less operations for each batch of primes we output. And obviously we can repeat through the remaining segments much quicker. And finally, we have our last prime in the range of 97. So we've calculated the same list of prime numbers, but the size of table we need for each step in the segmented sieve is only the square root of our peak number. So let's say we wanted to go up to a million, we'd only need a 1000 entry table, which feels like it scales a lot better. Even on a 16-bit processor, a thousand entry table feels like quite a small amount of memory. In my CPU demo, I went up to 65,536, which is 2 to the power of 16. And that meant my segment size was 256, which is a nice round number for an 8-bit processor to be dealing with. But let's pause just for a minute and talk about some of the implementation considerations. OK, so when you sit down to implement the sieve, especially if you're doing it in assembly language, there's a few things that it's definitely worth thinking about. Now, firstly, we can easily get rid of the even numbers. Now, only the first prime number is an even number, so that's two. And then we spend a significant amount of time crossing out all of the multiples of two for each of the segments. And in fact, we can just ignore that. Now, the way I did this in my CPU is I manually output two as a little bit of a hack. But then when I was going through the strikeout phase for the other prime numbers, I just added on two times the prime number and not one. And that allowed me to skip all the even multiples of those prime numbers. So it's much quicker all round. In fact, you can do a more complicated schema involving multiples of a group of primes in order to speed up much larger versions of the sieve. But in terms of the implementation I did, just skipping the even numbers was a nice little optimization, and it was very simple to implement. Now, another one is that the registers that you store your working numbers in only need to be the size of the segment. If we look back at the table where we computed the list of primes for the segmented sieve, and only look at the modulus of the segment size, it gets interesting. So then in each loop going through the segment, we're only interested in the values that fit inside that segment. And when it falls out of the range of the segment, then we know that this is going to be one in the next segment. And in this case, we'd have to then do the modulus by 10 in order to roll the working value forward into the next line. And then when extracting the prime numbers, you take the index within the segment, and then you add the upper part of the index to the segment itself and that gives you the value of the prime. If we're doing this on a processor and we conveniently make the segment size a power of two, this operation becomes a mask. And if the operation itself is the size of a register, then it's actually very curious because the value will automatically wrap around ready for the next segment, but the carry flag in the addition is going to tell us exactly when we finish stepping through the values within that segment's range. In fact, if we jump here to my implementation of the segmented sieve that I did for my CPU, you can see here that's exactly what I do. I use 8-bit registers for both the current prime number and for the index into the segment buffer. And then I use the carry flag, in this case a jump if not carry, back to the start of the loop where I'm striking out in order to implement a very simple loop. Now this segmented form of the sieve is what I implemented for that demonstration on my 8-bit pipeline CPU. Although there were a few times when I referred to it as an incremental version of the sieve. And that's because the two terms are often used a little bit interchangeably. Although I looked at the Wikipedia entry and it's uh, got quite strong delineation between the segmented and the incremental sieve. So what I will do now is talk about the differences in the algorithm to move the segmented sieve to a fully incremental version of the sieve. So with the segmented sieve, we took advantage of our knowledge that the highest prime number we need to calculate all of the primes in our range are primes up to the square root of that range. So if we implemented the segmented sieve and continued segments beyond our original range, sooner or later we're going to hit a composite number that we haven't struck out. 
and we're going to incorrectly attribute it as prime. But we can extend the algorithm in order to allow us to continue indefinitely. And that's the true incremental sieve. The way we do that is we store all the prime numbers we find in a list. And we have a separate active prime numbers list, which is those primes that we're actively striking out. Each time we find a prime number, we calculate the square of that prime and store it alongside the prime. And then whenever we start a new segment, we check the lowest prime numbers in our inactive list, and we move the ones whose square falls inside the current segment into the active list. And then that value forms the starting point for all of our additional striking out using that prime. So you can see that the sieve of Eratosthenes and its variants are quite simple and yet interesting algorithms. I certainly thought this was an interesting first algorithm to implement on my CPU. Calculating primes feels like real computing work, even if we're only going up to the 16-bit range. Well, I hope you found it interesting, and thanks a lot for watching. Let me know in the comments if there's anything else that you think needs a little bit more elaboration, or anything else I've made reference to over the course of the CPU build that you think perhaps deserves its own video. All right, goodbye.